Australia's first and only regional stock exchange. Three times a day, the card would be called in front of a heady mix of miners, brokers, townsfolk, and rogues. Right, today we have Dave Dawn and Bill. Brilliant. Telegraph lines connected the exchange to cities all around the world and buzzed with speculation of the seemingly endless wealth from underground. The Stock Exchange opened in 1890, by which time Charters Towers was immersed in Queensland's biggest gold rush. Three prospectors, Hugh Mossman, George Clark and John Fraser, and an Aboriginal horseboy, Jupiter Mossman, came into the area in December 1871. They explored a cluster of conical and square-topped hills and soon discovered gold. Within a few days, they'd found 10 rich quartz reefs on the 26th of January 1872, Mossman applied to Gold Commissioner WSEM Charters at Ravenswood for a protection area and named the place in his honour. Charters Towers was about to quickly take shape. Queensland had long hoped for a gold rush as the colony had observed with envy the massive changes brought about by the discovery of the rich gold fields in the southern states. It brought people investment and transform the infrastructure. In fact, sizeable rewards were offered for any significant discoveries. All those things Queensland sought, it was about to get right here. By 1877, there was sufficient self-confidence for the residents to petition for self-government as a municipality on the basis that the town contains 1,500 inhabitants and is one square mile in area Buildings of a superior description are being erected almost daily. The municipality of Charters Towers was declared in June 1877. Most of Charters Towers gold was not alluvial. It was reef gold buried deep underground. What they needed was machinery to extract it. This is the largest surviving gold battery relic in Australia. What also makes this unique is that it was a public mill, open to everyone, as long as you could pay your way. They were committed to creating a successful gold town, even if it meant building it themselves. But to develop the ground sufficiently and economically, more capital that could be well spared from other local enterprises will be required. So spoke the newly appointed mining warden, Mr. Selheim. The search for external funds was to reap immediate rewards but was to also have some unfortunate consequences. In 1885, a group of stockbrokers formed a mining exchange. This allowed many locals to become speculators in lots of the mines that were setting up in the region. Involving the locals and the miners directly in the financial affairs of the town was a prime force in the rapid development of Charters Towers in the 1880s. Local confidence in the mining industry was at an all-time high. The residents could see no end to their prosperity as the town cityfied and urbanised. Many of the timber buildings which had replaced the original shanties of the 1870s were demolished to make way for the brick-rendered Victorian buildings, still in evidence today. This is City Hall, built in 1891 at the height of the town's wealth. It was originally the Queensland National Bank and it's a great symbol of how the town in the 1890s really wanted to show the rest of the world how prosperous it was. In short, the more visible the signs of prosperity, the more 
overseas funds flowed in. The local newspaper editor went as far as to describe the town as the world. He reasoned that anything a civilised person would want could be found in what was at the time Queensland's second largest city. This is the former Australian Bank of Commerce. It's a reminder that financial crashes are nothing new. The bank was built in the most ostentatious style in 1891. But the following year, whilst speculation in the area was rife, the bank collapsed. The Pyrides Processing Plant was another Chartist House institution that was to fall foul of financial mismanagement and poor timing. On the 8th of July, 1901, an extraordinary meeting of shareholders was convened in this building here to discuss the financial problems, including the reduction of the manager's wages, Mr Brown, from £6 to £4. <laughs> Brown was furious. Mr Brown demanded of the meeting that the minutes be read out for that insulting decision. The chairman, Mr Hayward, at the head of the table, refused point blank. Tension in the room mounted. Finally, Mr Brown's frustration boiled over. He pulled a gun from his coat pocket, pointing it and threatening Mr Hayward here, finally discharging a bullet into the back of his head. Locals swear that Mr Hayward's blood has stained this boardroom table forever. The town survived its financial crisis and quickly expanded to upwards of 25,000 people. It's estimated that six million ounces of gold was won in the first 50 years of the life of the towers. The gold supply peaked in 1899 and rapidly declined. To the complete disbelief of the local community, the golden era was over. Charters Towers was woken from its post-gold rush slumber by the noise from the RAAF and US Air Forces. Australia's involvement in the Second World War had changed dramatically. The focus had shifted from the battlefields of Europe to defending its own backyard. Japanese attacks along the entire northern coast of Australia had focused the hearts and minds of our politicians and military leaders. Charters Towers was to play a significant role, especially if the massive bases at Townsville were to come under attack. Four fully sealed dual air bases were constructed in and around Charters Towers. One of them was built in a record six weeks by the Australian Civil Construction Corps. This one, here at Breton, was the major maintenance and repair depot for the entire Northeast Command. American bomber squadrons that had relocated here after leaving the Philippines began to fly missions out of Charters Towers. Up to 10,000 service personnel were in town at regular intervals. Major fuel storage capacity was constructed. Ammunition bunkers were buried deep into Tower Hill. There was also a small civilian exodus from Townsville as the Japanese threat increased. Strategically, Charters Towers became the backup, particularly if Townsville was ever subjected to a Darwin type of attack. There's very little physical evidence to show where the 1,500 people who were stationed here at Breton lived and worked, although this unusual building is pretty significant with one foot thick solid concrete walls, windows above bomb blast height. It looks much more like a command post to me. Although what we do know is it finished its days as a beer store. You couldn't want a safer place, I reckon. Many planes didn't make it back from New Guinea and many more suffered horrific accidents in general service. 390 US Air Force personnel died on active duty here in this district. One particularly horrific accident involved a US Air Force A-20 Douglas Havoc, which was taking off from the aerodrome here and clipped another Havoc bomber that was being serviced on the runway. 13 personnel died in that accident. It was the worst of its kind here at Charters Towers. All deceased American servicemen have since been returned to the United States. These are Australian service personnel who remain in Charters Towers. 
Charterst House sits in the heart of Queensland cattle country. It's a unique place at the crossroads of central Queensland. Michael Bethel and his family live near the town. Michael went to school in Charters Towers and now runs a few head of Texas Longhorns on his property. I guess the, <coughs> the best trait of the Longhorns is their fertility. Um, they, they browse really well, they're, they're hardy, they fit in with most, you know, in the most climates and they uh, cross well with most breeds of cattle. So, you know, we've, we've always reckoned they're the only breed of cattle you can sell every part of, Scott, you can even, including their reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's special skill, though, is saddle making. Oh, mate, this is terrific. So this is where it all happens. This is your old Australian stock saddle. Yep, that's it. As you've uh, seen in the 19th century, no problem. Yep, yep, yep. This is an expensive saddle. Um, this saddle's going to, you know, run over 5,000. We don't make a saddle under three and a half thousand dollars, and there's there's still plenty of demand. I mean, I have probably at the moment I've got almost 12 months worth of work in front of me. So, you know, gee, that's not bad. It only took you half a day to make too. It, gee, no, you're on fire, mate. <laughs> so there's a great pride in your craftsmanship. Yeah, I, you know, there's an old there's an old saying, you know, that uh, you do what you love and love what you do, you know, and don't start something that you can't follow through. And that's I just love saddle making. I mean. I've never been sick of it. Charters Towers remains Queensland's gold rush capital. As you can see, the prospectors are still finding enough to keep them interested, but it's more a hobby than a passion these days. <laughs> nice. The history here can be seen by simply strolling down the main street. It wears it like a badge of honour. Charters Towers goes out of its way to celebrate its past. And that, in my book, makes it an Australian icon town. Thank you.